to the organizers for uh, putting our paper on. This is joint work with Lorenzo back there and uh, Shri. So I'll start the presentation um, at a similar spot as I start my investments class. Um, so I, uh, you know, I'll start where where I start my investments class, which is uh, of, with this idea of Markowitz portfolios. And you know, I think we all agree that this is super intuitively appealing. The idea that covariance risk emerges as what matters for asset allocation, right? So, you know, uh, higher covariance, you would have to have higher returns to put an equal weight for that asset in your portfolio. Okay. I do a bunch of like in class uh, trading exercises, like experimental stuff. And it turns out that, you know, that holds up pretty well experimental in class. Okay. And then we move on and we say, well, let's think about an equilibrium framework. And what emerges out of that is the CAP M model where the portfolio that people choose to hold is the market portfolio. And again, the covariance risk with the market is what matters for pricing assets. And this also works extremely well experimentally in class, as long as you have the assumptions of the cap. And then I have them take it to the data, and we all have seen this picture before. My students generated this particular one. And I have them plot beta sorted portfolios against the actual returns Everything, CAPM predicts everything should be on that orange line, but you end up with a pretty flat line, okay? So we, we start to pontificate. Why, why do you think CAPM has failed? What, what in this stream of deductions or assumptions have gone wrong that we see it happen experimentally in class, but we don't see it happen uh, in the data? And of course, there's always one student who proudly says, I know why. And I can show you exact evidence of why, which is my own portfolio, which recently has sold something like this, but 95% of what they own is in some fad stock, GameStop, Bitcoin, whatever. And the last 10, you know, 1% is whatever the treasury bond or, you know, investment that their parents or grandparents gave them at some point in time, right? Of course, sometimes this, the pictures on this graph will flip entirely when the things crash. You can also ask ChatGPT why does CAPM fail? Um, this is 3.5, so I suspect maybe 4.0 has a better answer. Um, but they're going to come up with the first thing it's going to come up with is something similar to what my students say, which is this assumption that we're all doing exactly the same thing and holding the exact same portfolio doesn't isn't true in the data, and it may be that sort of other, uh, you know, other factors might matter and different portfolios might matter. I'll also point out that 3.5 did not answer this question very well because it says CAPM assumes a single factor and I would argue that CAPM deduces a single factor, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, what about professional managers? Do they look like my students? Well, there is a lot more like my students than they look like a market holder on average, right? So. Uh, 13 F managers tend to hold median about 75 stocks and an average R squared with the market of 0.73. Okay, so professional managers don't hold the market either. I think we all are sort of familiar with this fact, but the point of this paper is to understand what does that mean for portfolio level covariance risk, right? If they are paid based on sort of their performance, and their performance is volatile, these managers might care about the riskiness of their own portfolio, right? Maybe don't, they don't just represent the risk preferences of the people who invest in them. This was definitely true. I worked at a hedge fund. Uh, my portfolio manager was short a bunch of like home builder ETFs. And I was like, we're a distressed debt fund. What are you doing? Uh, and, and he was like, yeah, if, you know, if the whole sector goes pear-shaped, we lose the fund, we all lose our jobs. But if we you know, ha have a hedge on there and slightly underperform our peers, you know, that's, that's something that's manageable for us, okay? So to introduce the actual question we're asking, you know, there's a lot of prior literature that, that looks for single factors that drive returns or multi-factor models that drive returns. And more recently, we've been considering a lot more of the clientele of who owns assets and how that affects asset prices. You know, for example, intermediaries, well, do these 
people play a, a, or, or institutions play an outsized role in the determination of prices. And we've also kind of considered how investor specific preferences through demand based frameworks uh, affect prices. And we're just going to try to take a bit of a combined approach, say, well, let's assume some sort of Markowitz portfolio theory is operating in the background here. What does that mean for asset prices in a world of segmentation? So I'm going to just give a concrete example of how we're going to measure this idea of portfolio level risk across funds and assets, and then we'll show some of the results. So SRS investment fund, this is actually a fund of a friend of mine uh, from college. It's a mostly tech fo focused fund. And this is just a printout of, I think their most recent 13 F. Okay. So if we wanted to think about what is the investor beta, portfolio level covariance risk of, of let's say meta, what I would do is I would say, calculate the beta or the covariance of meta stock with respect to SRS's investment return. Do this at a monthly level, daily level, it doesn't matter. Okay? And I would do this for every single fund that owns meta, right? So I'd have a fund by stock beta for each of the funds that uh, own, own meta. And then I'm just going to aggregate across funds. So I can take the uh, share weighted average across all these. And that's going to give me the main measure of this paper. Okay. So the average, you know, share weighted beta of all the funds who own the stock with respect to that fund's returns. I'll also take a quick pause here to show that my friend really likes rental cars. <laughs> they have 50% of their portfolio in Avis. That has done very well for them. Okay, here's a preview of the results. So if I take this investor beta measure and I sort into portfolios, what I end up with is what we kind of would, would have wanted the cap M to look like, okay? So as we increase investor betas, we get higher excess returns and the slope of this line is about 6%. Okay, that's gonna be the main point of this paper. We'll do a bunch of robustness, but if there's one takeaway, it's this picture. As I said, this is going to uh, key into a lot of literature that exists. Okay, so um, you know, I talked about all of this evolution in asset pricing. I mean, you could put a thousand papers up here and still not be, you know, complete. Um, there's also sort of a, a different segment of the asset pricing literature that this uh, relates to, which is there are papers that show that asset managers are actually not so terrible at stock picking, particularly if you look at their sort of largest allocation, right? So some of that stuff is going to be sort of closest in methodology to what we're doing today. All right. So I want to take a step back and, and talk about sort of an extreme example of why this might matter. Um, and then we can sort of talk about what we actually do in the paper. So let's think about a perfectly segmented world where you have stock investors and bond investors, and there's no cross pollination between these two markets. So what happens in this world? Well, let's assume all of the assumptions cap and hold and everyone knows everything. We're all, we're all good, but they are totally segmented in what they can invest. So cap N is going to hold we measure bond market re returns with respect to the bond market. And cap M is going to hold if we measure stock market returns with respect to the stock market. But the second we include sort of a, a broad market index, this is going to fail. This is kind of the opposite of what we do in, in asset pricing, right? Because we just assume the stock market for everything. But, but broadly, in, in, this, in this perfect segmentation world, that's what we, would happen, right? And the extent to which it fails is determined by the correlation structure of returns between the two markets. Okay, so we're just going to write down a model that, that doesn't have perfect segmentation. It relaxes this, this assumption a little bit, but it has segmentation holding that is systematic amongst investors. And there isn't some super deep pocketed, deep pocketed arbitrage who can come in and sort of even everything out. Okay, so what's going to come out? Well, it's going to, 
it's going to be very similar to sort of a standard cap m result but what we're going to say is that uh, the returns on an asset is going to be related to the level of risk aversion of the investors times some measure of the covariance but the covariance is not with respect to the market it's respect with respect to sort of the portfolio of people who hold it and we can express this in beta form and sum across all the investors and we get exactly what our investor beta measure You can put a stark example down where we really concoct a covariance structure to really illustrate our point. But you could have four assets where, uh, for example, one and four are highly correlated and two and three are highly correlated. But the investors in one can't hold three, which would be the ideal, uh, sorry, can't hold, uh, uh, can't hold four, which would be the ideal hedge for them, right? And so what you end up with is, if I just measure everything with respect to the market betas, I get this kind of picture that doesn't look like anything. But once I take into account the holding constraints of the investors, it looks like betas line up with expected return. Okay, so we're just gonna take all of this and apply it to the data in the exact same analog. So I'm gonna run regressions at the fund level for every stock of the returns of that stock against the returns of the funds for every fund that holds that stock. So that's gonna give me a beta J for all the funds J that hold the stock I. And then I'm gonna go ahead and aggregate those using the share weights as we did in, in the example before. Okay, and that gives me my investor beta estimate for each stock I. Now, I should point out that uh, in our baseline model, we're also going to take out in this first stage the market return. Now, this isn't strictly necessary. Uh, it turns out to, to uh, matter in the equity markets because we know that sort of the market has a flat SML. And perhaps not surprisingly, returns of funds are correlated with the market. So by eliminating the market returns in the first stage, you end up getting sort of a more precise estimate of these days. Okay. When we take it to the appearance in equities, we're gonna use standard data, uh, 13F for holdings, CRISP for prices and returns. In the bond market, we've actually seen this, you know, already presented today, there's this Emacs holdings database. Uh, so we're gonna use that for the holdings and then trace FISD and words for all the other data. And we're gonna do some of the standard stuff. We're gonna do test portfolios uh, sorted directly on this investor beta, multiple sorts. So we could start with some French 25s. We can do it at the stock or the bond level. Um, and we're basically gonna be you know, looking at these second stage regressions and seeing whether or not investor beta matters. Okay, so this is that first picture I showed you just to reiterate. I have 10 portfolios of investor beta sorted on that, plotted against returns. These are equal weighted, but you can do uh, value weighted as well. You get the same, same looking picture, maybe a slightly lower slope. Okay. Do the exact same thing for bond markets. You get a, also a very nice fit with this very positive slope. Investor beta seem to matter uh, for, for returns. So, I mean, when I first looked at that picture, I thought, well, maybe there's something mechanical going on here. Um, so we, we do a lot in the paper to try and convince you that this isn't some mechanical relationship. You know, I, I start to outperform on stocks, that increases the weight, it increases the beta, and you get some sort of feedback loop here. So uh, we can, the first thing we do is just exclude the stock we're measuring when we're measuring the portfolio returns for these betas, and it doesn't change anything. We can exclude the windows over which we're measuring returns from uh, uh, in the beta measurements from the sample period. Again, that doesn't exclude anything. And we can go sort of daily and like, exclude again the, the, the measurement period from the, the return period. And again, we're gonna observe something extremely similar. Okay, and here's what we observe. 
in our baseline model, uh, it's a return premium for a unit of investor beta of about 6%. We can see that sort of it still holds up as we do some of these other models. Uh, the, the return premium per unit of beta declines, but that's mostly just because the beta span increases when we look at some of these other frameworks. Um, the sort of five minus one portfolio looks pretty similar. And then, of course, if you look at daily, we actually get a slightly uh, higher coefficient there. And again, in the bond market, we find something similar. We find a unit beta has a return frame of about 1.3%. Actually, here controlling for the market because bond market betas are do actually do a pretty good job of pricing bond market returns, we actually get a sharper estimate um, uh, in that setting. Okay, I want to sort of uh, propose the interpretation. So using this framework, using the, the observed uh, slope of this line, we can back out a gamma estimate for equities of six and uh, for bonds of four. And then we can look at the, the variance ratio between the variance actually experienced by funds and the market variance, right? So on average, undiversified funds have higher variance than the market itself. And we can kind of do the following exercise where we're going to assess how much of the market risk premium could be attributed to this lack of diversification in the funds. Okay, and it's just, I mean, this is a very back of the envelope, very crude calculation. Take the difference in the variances, multiply it by the gamma, annualize it algebraically, you get a 2.5% of the market risk premium could be attributed to these uh, this lack of diversification. Okay, so we do a, 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 again a lot more in the paper. We form placebo portfolios to try and sort of again confirm that this is not some mechanical thing. So we're going to find for every fund that owns a stock, another fund that looks a lot like it but doesn't own that stock. Run the same analysis there, and we find basically nothing. We can run this with lots of other factor modelers, either in the second stage or in the first stage when we're estimating these betas. And again, we don't find that it really moves things around much. Um, and then the last thing we do in the paper is we want to kind of come up with a setting where we can really drill down and isolate that it is the risk exposure of the funds that own the stock not some underlying fundamental about the stock that is driving our effect. And that's where the bond market actually comes in really nicely because we can control for the same uh, firm and look across the bonds that that firm owns, what are the, whether or not those bonds respond differently to their investor beta or whether or not they have different investor betas. Okay, so we can include a firm by time fixed effect at the bond level analysis. And what we find is that doing that actually doesn't change our results at all. So the same firm can have multiple bonds that are owned by different people and investor beta drives returns in that sense. The only time that it goes away is once we include firm by time by maturity bucket fixed effects. And there, I think you know, what's happening here is the arbitrage opportunity is so clean and I can buy one bond, one 10 year bond of a firm, short the other one, that that's enforcing prices are the same, and there we don't see investor betas driving. Okay. So just to conclude, uh, point we're trying to make is that the covariance risk at the portfolio level seems to aggregate and matter for asset prices in a way that sort of Markowitz portfolio theory would predict. It's just that the portfolio in question doesn't isn't the market, right? It's the portfolios that people actually choose to have. And we think sort of this sheds light on the potentially how much risk premium is, is there because of lack of diversification. And we think it could be incorporated into some of these demand frameworks. But, thanks.